Hello everybody and happy Halloween to you. It is the spookiest time of year and I like to do a ranking video usually around this time of year taking on a horror franchise or a group of movies that people usually watch around the Halloween season and this year I decided to take on one of my biggest projects yet. A24 is one of the premier names in movies right now but over the decade or so that they've been around they've also made a name for themselves in the horror genre and so I decided to take on every horror movie that A24 has ever made or released and rank them from bottom to top. And this actually presented a few difficulties because the number one question whenever we talk about horror movies is, well, what exactly is a horror movie and what exactly isn't a horror movie? And there are a lot of movies in the A24 library that could have gone either way. So I had to find some kind of metric to make the final determination for me. And what I decided to do is consult four big movie sites, Rotten Tomatoes, IMDb, Letterboxd, and Metacritic, if three out of those four sites listed a movie as being part of the horror genre, they went on the list. If less than three out of the four sites didn't list the movie as a horror movie, they were not on the list. And that really only affected three movies that aren't on this ranking list, High Life, Woodshock, and Enemy. Those do appear on some A24 horror lists, but they did not appear on three out of the four sites as horror films, although there are a few that did that I was surprised by, but by my own rules, I decided to include anyway. Now, if I had to do this all over again, I would have started a little bit earlier. I got a later start than I would have wanted. And the thing that I didn't account for is that when you're watching a bunch of A24 horror movies in a row, you gotta structure in some break time every once in a while. You gotta go outside, smell a flower, feel the wind in your face, wave to a baby, remind yourself that the world is bright and beautiful and worth living for because this got pretty bleak, especially when you're doing two, three, four movies a day. That's why the video's not out quite as early as I wanted it to be, but I still got it out by Halloween, so I guess it counts. So not only am I ranking these movies by how much I liked them, I'm also doing, as I often do on my ranked videos, a separate ranking for how A24 they are. And what I mean by that is, yes, A24 makes horror movies and they're all different kinds of horror films, but I had in my mind the picture of the stereotypical quote A24 horror movie and it basically had three different aspects. One of them is that it was bleak, either in its look or its feel or more often than not, both. Number two, it's abstract. It's non-traditional in some way. It's non-linear, it's tonal, any of those different things. And number three, there's a distinct divide between what critics think and what audiences think. That's not every horror movie, but I think when I imagine the stereotypical A24 horror film, that's part of it. So I'm not only gonna rank every A24 horror movie as far as personal preference, I'm also gonna give you a score for every one of them as to how A24 each one of them is, and we'll also look at that at the end of the video. So with all that out of the way, let's get to the ranking. There are 29 movies to get through, and the movie that is occupying the bottom spot on this list is one that you may not have heard of and you probably are less likely to have seen. It's a movie called False Positive. It was a Hulu original film that came out back in 2021. Alana Glazer and Justin Theroux are a couple trying to get pregnant and Pierce Brosnan plays their fertility specialist. This is powerful stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Eventually she does get pregnant with twins, but the couple has to decide which baby to keep after there are complications and eventually she also begins to suspect that there is a plot against her and the girl that she wants to deliver in favor of the boy. I've got to be honest here. I have no idea why A24 chose to put their name on this film because it has almost nothing in common with any other A24 horror movie. First of all, it's just a bad movie. It doesn't have any of the interest. Even in A24 movies that aren't my thing, this one doesn't have any of that. And it sends mixed messages. It's a very overt statement against the patriarchy, but it also has the lead character, who is a woman, saying that she believes her main focus as a woman is to get pregnant. As a woman, this is the one thing I'm supposed to be able to do and I can't do it. 
even other A24 horror movies that aren't very good also have some style, but this movie just looks cheap. The sets look cheap, the lighting is flat, so this doesn't really bring anything to the table. It really had me scratching my head, and all it really has going for it is attempted shock value, although a lot of those shocks are in endless dream sequences. At some point, there's so many dream sequences that you don't really care what's happening anymore. You just kind of want the movie to be over. The most interesting part of the movie, good or bad, is a scene where Justin Thoreau and Pierce Brosnan are revealed to be secret lovers. Is it real or is it a dream? I'll let you find out and decide, although I don't really think you should. This is just not a very good movie, and it's at the bottom of my list for a reason. When we look at it as far as how A24 it is, on the bleak scale, I'm going to give it a 6 out of 8, because there is a lot of rough stuff in this movie, real or imagined, that is, yeah, pretty bleak. On the abstract scale, a lot of it is straightforward, but as I mentioned, there is some dream sequences and stuff like that that kind of break the narrative convention. So I'm gonna give it a four out of eight. And then as far as the audience critic divide, audiences and critics both didn't like the movie. Critics gave it a 47% on Rotten Tomatoes, but audiences liked it even less, 19% on Rotten Tomatoes. That is a 28 point difference, which equates to a six out of eight on the scale of one through eight. And that gives False Positive a final score of A16 out of A24. So it's pretty A24, but not near the top of the list. Sometimes I wish I could clone myself. <laughs> it's the only way I get the job done. At number 28 on my list is a movie that I disliked for different reasons than the one we just talked about, and I think there are probably some people that are big fans of this one. It's a movie called In Fabric, a British film that got a very small, limited release. It stars Marianne Jean Baptiste as Sheila, a divorced mom who works at a bank and buys herself a nice dress at a weird local department store that prides itself on its discount. Their sales strategy is also what I say to myself in my head every time there's a Criterion flash sale. The hesitation in your voice, soon to be an echo in the recesses of the spheres of retail. In Fabric has some very Halloween 3 vibes, which kind of drew me in at first, but it's pretty experimental and artsy more and more as it goes along, and that's not necessarily a bad thing on its own, but this kind of feels like the movie that's like your college roommates or artsy European friends' favorite A24 film. It just seems to go overboard on a lot of this stuff, and there's ultimately nothing really for me to hang my hat on as far as characters go due to the film's narrative choices. However, if you're looking for a movie that has multiple scenes containing very in-depth washing machine jargon, then In Fabric is the one for you. The inner tub might have sustained serious dents, resulting in the belt drive loosening or coming off. There's also the possibility that the drain hose is kinked, but I can put that into writing for you after a more thorough inspection. I gotta give the movie credit for style, originality, and the performances, but ultimately it just didn't come together. I'm sure it comes together for some people, but not for me. When we look at it on the A24 scale, on the bleak scale, I'm gonna give it two out of eight. There are a couple of plot twists that are pretty bleak. On the abstract scale though, it gets an eight out of eight. This is one of the most abstract A24 films. And also on the audience critic divide, this is actually the second biggest gap of any movie on the list. Critics came in at 92%. Audiences came in at 52%, which is a 40 point gap between audiences and critics. So that's another eight out of eight for a final A24 score of A18 out of A24. If it had been just a little bleaker, it would have moved up this list. Do you think I'm bonkers? If I told you, I think something's wrong with that dress. Next up is another movie that I hadn't seen before, and it's also near the bottom of the list, and it's called Slice. It's the other one, along with False Positive, that I'm just not really sure why A24 put their name on it, because it is so amateurish, and it is so just... I, I don't know, I just don't get it. What kind of werewolf are you? The kind of werewolf that wants to deliver quality Chinese food at affordable prices. Slice is a comedy horror movie about a small town named Kingfisher that shares its space with ghosts until people start winding up dead and then people aren't so happy with the ghosts anymore. Zazie Beat stars as a pizza delivering tough girl and Chance the Rapper plays a werewolf named Dax Lysander who barely appears in the movie. Slice is trying to be what I call college film major cool. It's the kind of thing that I probably would have tried to make in college. Let's be honest, it's the kind of stuff I did make in college where all of the characters walk in slow motion to music and then pose for the camera and everybody drops F-bombs because that's how everybody knows that you're adult and edgy. I'm not a hero. 
I'm a fucking rascal. But the script for this movie is just awful. And I hate using this word, but I can't think of another word, cringy. I'm just a broken hearted broad on a mission for justice. You have some great comedians in there like Paul Shear that are doing their best to save this movie, but it's just not very good. It does have a really cool opening credit sequence and the score was co-composed by Ludwig Göransson, which shocked me. I mean, it was before he blew up, really blew up, but he'd done some pretty big movies already. That would be like finding out that John Williams did the score for Monster Squad. And by the way, that comparison is an insult to both John Williams and Monster Squad. Yeah, so Slice for me, fittingly near the bottom of the list. When we look at it on the A24 scale, for bleakness, I give it a 1 out of 8 because there are some murders and stuff, but it's not a very bleak movie. On the abstract scale, I'm giving it a 0 out of 8. This is the least complex movie probably on this list. And as far as the audience-critic divide, neither group liked it. Critics came in at 52%. Audiences came in at 34%. That's an 18-point gap, so it gets a 4 out of 8 score by that metric for a total A24 score of A5 out of A24, fittingly one of the least A24 movies and also one of the worst. Godspeed, you Chinese food werewolf. Next up is a movie called The Front Room, which came out earlier this year. It was co-written and co-directed by Max and Sam Eggers, brother to Robert Eggers, whose movies we'll see a little bit further down this list. Brandy stars in The Front Room as an expectant mother who unexpectedly has to take in her mother-in-law, and immediately the psychological games begin, including possibly some cult involvement. I say possibly because the movie brings it up as a possibility and then just decides not to do anything with it. I gotta give credit to Catherine Hunter, who plays the mother-in-law Solange. It is a 100% dedicated performance on her part to a character who is absolutely despicable. Well, my mother's name was Gertrude. Gertrude? I thought you were supposed to have more interest in names. What is that supposed to mean? But the front room itself is just a mess. It doesn't really seem to know what kind of horror movie it wants to be or if it even wants to be a horror movie at all. And this movie is full of more literal piss and crap than maybe any other movie that I've seen before. We're supposed to be scared of Solange and racism and cults and everything else, but the real horror in this movie is incontinence, real or imagined. I was actually looking forward to The Front Room when it came out, but this was just a big letdown, and it's a gross movie with a payoff that I don't think was really worth it. So it's at number 25 on the list. When we look at it on the A24 scale, Bleak, I'm going to give it a 4 out of 8, just for the pee and poop alone. As far as the abstract score, it gets a 5 out of 8 because they do try to at least show you some weird things. They just don't really know what to do with any of them. And as far as the audience critic divide, they were actually very close on this film. Critics gave it a 42%. Audiences gave it a 35%, so nobody really liked it that much. That's a 2 out of 8 on the scale for a total A24 score of A11 out of A24. Uh, yeah, if you missed the front room and you were thinking about seeing it, uh, I don't know. Don't bother. Are you? I don't know. What was his name? Walter. But I didn't know him really well. Call that a broken family. Solange, would you please stop? Coming in at number 25 on my list is a movie from director Kevin Smith, who I've said many times before in the past, I have a bit of a soft spot for. It's called Tusk, and it's based on an idea that he came up with along with Scott Mosier, I think, on his podcast. I remembered liking Tusk more when I saw it a long time ago than I actually did on rewatch. I think maybe the novel things in this movie made more of an impression on me than the things I didn't like. Well, it was kind of the other way around the second time I watched it. Justin Long plays a podcaster who travels to Canada for his podcast, which is called the Not See Party. Get it? The Not See Party? and crosses paths with an old man played by Michael Parks who kidnaps him and plans to turn him into a human walrus. I've been constructing a very realistic walrus suit. It takes us about 60% of the movie's runtime just to get to that point, and it's mostly because Kevin Smith just loves his dialogue and packs this movie with pages-long dialogue scenes that just drag. I mean, it's okay when we're watching Michael Parks because that dude is just a fascinating actor to watch, but I was not amused by Johnny Depp's detective, Guy Lapointe. It feels like a joke that only he and Kevin Smith are in on. What we really need to do is discern this uh, podcaster's ritual uh, while he is driving. 
It's definitely freaky in a body horror sort of way, and it's an interesting concept, but the movie just can't sustain that interest for its entire runtime, and it completely runs out of steam. It does have some of that Kevin Smith humor that I like, but I felt that Tusk was a task for me on rewatch, and I ended up putting it much lower on the list than I had anticipated. Looking at it as far as how A24 it is, on the bleakness scale, I'm gonna give it a six out of eight. There's not a whole lot of hope in this movie. On the abstract scale, eh, this is pretty straightforward as Kevin Smith's movies tend to be, so it gets a one out of eight. And as far as the audience critic divide, well, again, neither group really loved it. Critics gave it a 46%, audiences gave it a 36% for a score of two out of eight, which gives it a total A24 rating of A9, out of A24. So if you wish to continue living, you will be a walrus or you will be nothing at all. Next up at number 24 is an early A24 horror comedy starring Dane DeHaan and Aubrey Plaza called Life After Beth. It came out amidst the zombie craze of the mid-2010s and was one of the first dozen movies that A24 released. Aubrey Plaza plays Beth, the recently deceased girlfriend of Dane DeHaan's Zach, who mysteriously reappears a few days after her funeral. As Zach tries to rekindle his relationship with Beth, which was already rocky before her death, he begins to notice some strange behavior which escalates along with an obviously growing worldwide threat. Life After Beth is fine, I guess, but it's not particularly remarkable, largely because, like Tusk, I think that this is a premise that just isn't able to support an entire movie, even an 89-minute movie. Aubrey Plaza is great. She really gets to tap into a wild side of her acting abilities. I'm Beth and I'm alive! Okay! Oh, no. I'm Beth! And Dane DeHaan is actually a passable comedy romance lead. I wonder if he was just typecast in all of the serious roles. When we look at the cast, though, I really do have to give a shout out to John C. Riley and Molly Shannon, who play Beth's parents and who grow increasingly desperate to hide her reappearance from the rest of the world. All right, that's enough of that. Life After Beth isn't really that bad, so I guess we're kind of moving up into a different tier here. When we look at how A24 the movie is, I'm going to give it a 3 out of 8 score as far as bleakness goes, because we are talking about the apocalypse and the story takes some dark turns. On the abstract scale, I'm going to give it a 0 out of 8. This is a pretty standard horror comedy approach. And when it comes to critics and audiences, neither of them were really fans. Critics gave the movie 46%, audiences gave it 31%. That's a 15% difference, which translates to a 3 out of 8 and gives Life After Beth a total A24 score of A6 out of A24. You ate a guy. Oh, what do you want from me, Zach? I'm a f***ing zombie. Zombies eat guys. Up next at number 23 is a movie from somebody who I think is one of the most interesting directors working today. It's the film Men from director Alex Garland, which was a first time watch for me. I actually skipped it in theaters when I first heard the reviews and the reaction to the film. And honestly, I think I made the right choice. Jesse Buckley plays a woman who recently lost her husband and decides to rent a huge house in the middle of the countryside to unwind. Soon she finds herself menaced by various men around town who all seem to be variants of the actor Rory Kinnear. Year. Not in real life, but, you know, he plays all these characters. And honestly, his most memorable role in the movie is the lame but seemingly harmless owner of the house. Kitchen, just through there. Uh, tea in the cupboard, milk in the fridge. Just wait, expect to find them. <laughs> Man is genuinely creepy for the first half or so, but then it gets more and more abstract and eventually, to me, became pretty much incoherent. I'm sure people can break it down and say how it's an allegory and a metaphor for processing grief and the patriarchy and all this kind of stuff. And I'm sure those messages are there and perfectly valid, but the presentation just wasn't there for me. And I was just kind of waiting for it to be over. It's kind of unpleasant to watch at other times. Plus you can't tell me how deep a movie is when one of its first images is the extremely obvious reference to Eve's original sin of eating the forbidden fruit. Oh yeah, what a rich and deep metaphor. This movie's really not for me, but if you're in the market for a horror film where a naked man with a plant face gives graphic birth to another naked man who gives graphic birth to another naked man who gives graphic birth to another naked man out of his back who gives graphic birth to a character's dead husband out of his mouth then men is the movie for you and i would wager the only movie for you 
As far as the A24 scale, on bleakness, I'm giving it a 7 out of 8. Yeah, there is like constant peril and disturbing stuff all throughout this film. On the abstract scale, I'm giving it another 7 out of 8. It really only gets one point knocked off because the first half hour or so is pretty straightforward. And then on the audience critic divide, critics came in at 69%, but audiences came in at 41%. That's a 28 point difference. So I'm giving it a 6 out of 8 on the audience critic divide. And that gives us our highest A24 score yet, an A20 out of A24 for men. Seems to me like they might have gotten. Next up at number 22 is a movie called Lamb, which is a horror movie from Iceland, so you know it's going for that 8 out of 8 on the bleak scale. Numi Rapace plays a woman who tends a farm with her husband and is shocked to discover that one of their sheep has given birth to some kind of human-lamb hybrid, which they then raise as their own child. Then not much happens for a little while. The lamb's cute, it dances around, and it's followed by a bunch of depressing stuff at the end. If you want to know the definition of slow horror, then look no further than Lamb. It is an interesting looking film. It's an interesting concept. It's a beautiful looking movie, but it's not exactly what I would call a compelling watch throughout. There are definitely some WTF moments sprinkled in here or there, but I'd say that Lamb is a vibe more than it's a film. If you're in the mood for some bleak Icelandic horror, then I guess that this would probably be your go-to. Lamb also features a running theme in many A24 horror movies, which is that if the family has a dog, don't get too attached to that dog. As far as how A24 this movie is, well, on a bleak scale, as I mentioned, this is a horror movie from Iceland, so it gets an 8 out of 8 in both look and tone. On the abstract scale, it definitely gets another 8 out of 8 on multiple fronts. And as far as the audience critic divide, critics came in at 86%, audiences came in at 58%. That's a 28 point difference, which means that Lamb gets a six out of eight as far as the division between audiences and critics. And wow, we've got a new leader in the clubhouse, folks, because Lamb gets an A22 out of A24 on the how A24 is at scale. Up next at number 21 is an A24 film that I think was really done dirty by its marketing campaign that did not set proper expectations for the film. And that movie is called It Comes at Night, which was one of the first A24 films that was sold to moviegoers as a mainstream horror movie and sorely disappointed many of them. This is a depressing, harrowing survival story that actually doesn't have a whole lot of horror elements in it. Joel Edgerton, Carmen Ajogo, and Kelvin Harrison Jr. play a family trying to survive some sort of viral pandemic that kills anyone infected with it within hours. But when they take a new family into their home, tensions and suspicions soon arise. The horror elements are mostly body horror due to infection and some moments that we see in dream sequences. But there's no it that comes at night, which again is okay unless you're specifically telling audience that there is an it that's coming at night. It Comes at Night is mostly a slow burn featuring lots of shots of people walking very carefully down the same hall toward the same door in the family's house. It also helps to introduce us towards another thing that is an A24 standby, which is the uncomfortable family dinner scene. It's a fine survival movie if that's what you're looking for, but not exactly the most satisfying horror film. And as a drama, it's slow and depressing, which is also fine, but I don't think there's really much of a payoff for the time that you spend here. It's just a bummer. And, you know, I'm okay with movies that are a bummer, but if you're going to make a bummer movie, at least make it an interesting bummer. As far as how A24 it is, on bleakness, it gets an 8 out of 8. This is a bleak, harrowing, depressing film. On the abstract scale, it's actually not as abstract as you would think it would be. I'm giving it a 2 out of 8. And as far as the audience critic divide, this movie actually has the biggest gap between critic rating and audience rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Critics gave it an 88%. The all audience score is a 44%. That's a 44 point difference. So this gets an 8 out of 8 and I would give it a 10 out of 8 if I could, which means that the total A24 score for It Comes at Night is A18 out of A24. Next up at number 20 is one of the more obscure A24 movies, largely because it was 
a predominantly streaming release. It's a movie called The Hole in the Ground, and it's from Lee Cronin, who later went on to direct Evil Dead Rise, which is a movie that I liked. A single mom and her son settle into a new house when the boy begins to act strangely. Soon the mom finds out that this is not the first time that this kind of thing has happened in her town, and we get the old, is she crazy or is she right? horror setup. I will say that the presence of a massive growling hole in the forest near the mom's house may provide some clues to that question. Like many A24 horror films, this movie is a slow burn. And as the movie goes on, you can actually see how this was a pretty decent audition piece for Lee Cronin to take on an Evil Dead movie. It definitely has some style, some great performance, and yet another uncomfortable family dinner scene. Plot-wise, it's nothing we haven't seen before, but I think it's elevated by how well-made the movie is. And generally, I think the hole in the ground lands in the not bad, but ultimately forgettable range of A24 horror. As far as how A24 it is, on the bleakness scale, I'm giving it a 6 out of 8. There's some pretty messed up stuff that happens in this movie. On the abstract scale, it just gets a 1 out of 8. We got a couple visions and dreams, etc., but not too many. And as far as the audience critic divide, it was pretty hefty here. Critics gave it an 83%. Audiences gave it a 47%. That's a 36-point difference, which is a 7 out of 8 on the audience critic divide metric, which gives the hole in the ground an A14 out of A24. Stop lying to me! I'm not lying! Next up is the rare A24 horror sequel, and it is the third and final film in the X trilogy that also came out earlier this year. It's called Maxine, and unless the X trilogy decides to get a revival, it will be the last movie in that series. Ty West and Mia Goth return to tell the story of Maxine, who survived her brush with death in X, to become a successful porn star in 1985 Los Angeles, who's trying to become a legitimate actress. You'll see the other two films in the X trilogy higher up on this list, and that's because I don't really think that this finale does a whole lot to tie everything together other than the obligatory references to the previous films and really the first X more than anything. It definitely has style. If X was Texas Chainsaw and Pearl is Technicolor, Maxine is Argento's style splatter horror, the kind you'd see on the shelves of the video store that Maxine lives above. I also like the cast. Mia Goth is great. I love Kevin Bacon as a sleazy Nolan's PI. Oh yeah, we're just fine, darling. Thank you. Thank you so much. Say, you want something to drink? I'm on expense account. And I'm not sure what Giancarlo Esposito... My name is Giancarlo Esposito. ...is doing as Pearl's agent slash lawyer, but I like it. Well, get lost. We'll clean up the mess. Really, it just comes down to the fact that I thought this was a pretty underwhelming end to the X trilogy. The first two movies I thought had style and substance. This one felt a little bit more like style over substance. It's a well-made film and it looks really good, but there just wasn't a whole lot there for me. Honestly, I'm open to the idea that maybe the movie was just making a meta point that horror franchises shouldn't overstay their welcome. It's a motel from Psycho. They filmed a sequel here a few years back, if you can believe it. As far as the A24 scale for bleakness, it gets a four out of eight. There's some pretty grisly stuff in the film. As far as being abstract, I'm only giving it a 2 out of 8. And then when it comes to the audience critic divide, this is actually one of the closest of the movies I looked at. Critics gave it a 72%. Audiences gave it a 65%. That's just a 7% difference. And so it gets a 2 out of 8 for a total of A8 out of A24. I don't care what it takes. Squash it. I intend to. Speaking of movies that don't really come together, next is a film that I never would have included on a list of A24 horror films, but three of my four sources listed this movie as being part of the horror genre, so I live by the system and I die by the system. And that movie is Dream Scenario, which came out last year. Honestly, I think of this movie as more of an absurd comedy, if anything. Nicolas Cage plays Paul, a meek college professor who finds out that he's been appearing in the dreams of nearly everyone he knows and maybe everybody on the planet. While he enjoys his newfound fame, at first things take a darker turn when society's dreams start recasting him from a benevolent presence to a sadistic villain. Honestly, I think the first two thirds of Dream Scenario work pretty well in a Spike Jones kind of way, an absurd premise that allows the film to highlight Paul's inadequacies. I was born in 96. Check, please. 
No, no, I'm kidding. Like, like you're too young for me. As well as satire, things like the rampant commercialism that's introduced as soon as brands start figuring out that there's a guy out there that can get into anybody's head. That's kind of a fun story too. You know, like we tried to make people dream about Sprite and it didn't work. Yeah. I mean, it's so dumb. I love that. That is kind of yeah. cool. You know, it kind of works. But the movie runs out of steam about two thirds of the way through and it just kind of meanders its way to the end, which I think is a disappointment because I think that Dream Scenario had the makings of a cult classic at least. Still, the movie does provide a great showcase for Nicolas Cage, who does a fantastic job of bringing us one of the most awkward and pathetic dudes in recent cinema history. We thought it'd be nice for just us four. Okay, yeah. More wine for us. <laughs> as far as how A24 this film is, I'm giving it a four out of eight on the bleak scale. The dreams do get pretty dark. As far as how abstract it is, it gets a four out of eight because it does involve dreams, but it's also pretty straightforward. And when we look at the audience critic divide, critics gave it 91%, audiences gave it 76%. That's a 15 point difference, so it gets a three out of eight for a total score of A11 out of A24. I guess I'll see you in my dreams. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course not. <laughs> Coming in at number 17 on my list is The Black Coat's Daughter, which was mostly available on video on demand. This is also the first film directed by Osgood Perkins, who hit big with long legs earlier this year. Kiernan Chipka stars as a young girl at a Catholic boarding school whose parents don't show up to pick her up for winter break, and she's left with the only other girl in school as she waits for news about what exactly happened to her parents. Strange things, of course, begin to happen, and we also see the parallel story of another girl named Joan who's picked up by a married couple who also just happens to be headed towards the school. As the movie progresses, we begin to see how their stories intersect. And The Black Coat's Daughter is a great example of how you can see the progression of a director over time. Because a lot of the qualities that worked in Long Legs are also present here in The Black Coat's Daughter. But I think one thing that Osgood Perkins learned is that you can have tension and dread, but you have to bring just a little bit more to the table. This is a genuinely creepy film, and I like the direction that the story went. It's just a longer road to get there than I think it needs to be. Still, there are lots of moments that do work really well and a few surprises. I honestly think that the Osgood Perkins of today would make this movie a lot differently, and maybe in a way that would have put it on more people's radars. As far as how A24 it is, it gets an 8 out of 8 on the bleak scale, because yikes, this movie gets dark. As far as how abstract it is, it gets a 2 out of 8, and when it comes to the audience critic divide, critics gave it 76%, but audiences were cooler, they gave it 51%. That's a 25 point difference for a divide score of five out of eight, which gives the Black Coat's Daughter an overall A24 score of A15 out of A24. Next up is another movie that I would not have included in this ranking, but the system says that it was part of the horror genre. It's the third film from Ari Aster. It came out last year and it's called Bo is Afraid. Ari Aster has made all three of his movies so far with A24, and you're going to see both of them later. And Aster cashed in all the chips from his first two movies to make this three-hour journey inside the anxious mind of Bo, played by Joaquin Phoenix, a neurotic man living in some kind of modern hellscape who's trying to visit his overbearing mother, but keeps running into bigger and bigger obstacles along the way. I admire Ari Aster's ambition here, and I admire A24's dedication to him as an artist to make the movie that he wants to make. But ultimately for me, and my mind hasn't really changed since I saw the movie the first time, Bo is Afraid is far too scattershot. There are parts of the movie that work incredibly well, like Bo's home life, where he is constantly under assault from the never-ending chaos happening outside his window. But there are other parts that didn't work as well for me, like a 20-minute long play-slash-fantasy-slash-dream sequence that I think just grinds the movie to a halt. It's a beautiful looking section of the movie, but I don't think it's worth the time that was spent on it. The movie also takes some utterly bizarre turns. Once you've seen the inside of Bo's mother's attic, which I can't show here on the channel unless I want to get demonetized, you will never forget it. Bo is Afraid does have a lot going for it. It's genuinely funny in many places. It builds a really unique world where everything and everyone is a potential danger. It features a great performance from Joaquin Phoenix, and it also has both my favorite Bill Hader cameo and my favorite use of a Mariah Carey song in any movie that I can think of. But this is a movie I'm really just going to have to be content to admire, but also acknowledge that for me, it just doesn't completely work. 
When it comes to how A24 Bose Afraid is, on the bleakness scale, I'm gonna give it a six out of eight. There's some pretty messed up stuff that happens to Bo on his journeys. On the abstract scale, it definitely gets an eight out of eight, if only for the 20 minute long play in the middle of the movie. And as far as the audience critic divide, they were actually pretty close. Critics gave it a 68%, audiences gave it a 62%. That's just a six point difference for a score of two out of eight. So Bo's Afraid ends up with an A16 out of A24. 179. Oh no. <laughs> Up next at number 15 on my list is a movie that I watched for the first time when I was making this. It's from director Gaspar Noé, and it's called Climax. I'd heard this film was absolutely nuts, but it's weird because it's not at all until it really, really is. Climax takes place entirely in an old school that's being used as a rehearsal slash party space for an independent dance troupe. When someone spikes the punch with LSD, things get absolutely bananas. Now, I've never done LSD, big shocker, I know, but I feel like if it had the effects that we see in this movie, nobody would have gotten out of the 1960s alive. The wind up to All Hell Breaking Loose is very drawn out. I thought maybe I was being pranked at a certain point, but once everybody starts losing their minds, things kick into overdrive. And I loved how that was expressed technically through lighting and editing decisions and one extended long shot that takes us to the mouth of hell. Climax is definitely a lot and there are no boundaries. There are no sacred cows. And I can't think of a movie that takes us through a journey of sheer madness in the same way that this one did. It's a ride that you're tempted to try to get off of, but you stay on because you're just too curious to see what horror awaits you at the next dip or dive on the track. It's not a perfect movie, and it will test your patience at times, but I also think it's one that you're unlikely to forget. As far as how A24 this movie is, on the bleakness scale, easy 8 out of 8. On the abstract scale, easy 8 out of 8. But audiences and critics were actually very close together. Critics gave the movie a 69%. Audiences gave it a 65%. That's just a four-point difference. So it only gets a 1 out of 8 on the audience-critic divide, which ends up at an A17 out of A24. Well, from one of the most unconventional horror movies in A24's library, we go to one of the most conventional and another one of the more obscure ones. It's called The Monster, and it stars Zoe Kazan as an objectively pretty terrible mother who's driving her daughter, played by Ella Ballantine, who gives a great performance from a young actor, to her father's house. On the way there, though, their car breaks down on a dark, deserted, rainy road, and they find themselves stalked by a largely unseen but definitely vicious monster of some kind. This is really horror movie simplicity. Two characters in the dark trying to survive a monster, but what kind of puts it over the top is that they give us two characters that we care about because the movie is intercut with flashbacks where we see just how much Zoe Kazan has failed her daughter up to this point and just how much it's affected this little girl. So the movie becomes one that's not just about survival, but also redemption. As with most movie monsters, the less we see of the monster in this film, the more effective it is. But director Brian Bertino, who also made the first Strangers movie, is good at staging suspense sequences and also some well-executed scares. The monster doesn't have the ambition or the complexity of a lot of these other films, but it executes a very simple formula pretty well, and I don't think it should be punished for that necessarily. Simplicity done well can take a movie a long way, but it also limits a movie's upside. However, if you're looking for a well-made, well-acted, conventional horror movie, then the monster is a good pick that may have stayed off your radar until now. As far as its A24 score, I'm giving it a 4 out of 8 for bleakness, a zero out of eight on the abstract scale. This is a straightforward film. And when it comes to audiences and critics, it's actually a pretty wide gap. Critics gave it 79%, audiences gave it 40%, which is a 39% gap, one of the biggest of any movie on the list. So it gets a seven out of eight for a total A24 score of A11 out of A24. It's not gonna come after people. Promise. From this tier on up, I'd say that we are on a different level. The next 13 movies are all movies that I would say easily 
are good films. And I think a lot of these would be higher up people's lists. It just comes down to personal preference at this point. And we're going to start with number 13. We looked at the work of his brothers earlier, but we're going to look at the first film from director Robert Eggers on this list, which is The Lighthouse. His next film, by the way, Nosferatu hits theaters this Christmas. This is also the only A24 horror film so far to get an Oscar nomination for Best Cinematography, a very deserved nomination. I will say that there is at least one other performance in an A24 film that should have gotten an Oscar nomination. And Willem Dafoe is another one because I think he easily could have and maybe should have been nominated for an Oscar here for The Lighthouse. Dafoe and Robert Pattinson play two lighthouse keepers who are left on an isolated island to well, keep a lighthouse. That's what their job is. But when their relief doesn't show up and they're left stranded on the island, their already prickly relationship starts to sour even more as the two men fight off hunger, resentment, and eventually madness and try to figure out why they've seemingly been left stranded together indefinitely. How long have we been on this rock? Five weeks? Two days? Where are we? The Lighthouse is what I like to call a painting movie. It's one of those movies where you could hit pause, print out the image on the screen, and just hang it on the wall as a painting. And it's also a great acting showcase for both Willem Dafoe and Robert Pattinson. Dafoe has the showier role. Let Neptune strike ye dead, Winslow! Hawk! But honestly, I admired Pattinson's performance even more on this rewatch, not necessarily more than Defoe's, but I think that it's a lot more equal than most people might give him credit for. Now I got it all figured out. You said, what's the secret mischief you're keeping? Up there! Some people might be surprised to see it this low on my list, but as I said, these movies are all good, and the only reason it's a little bit lower is that it leaves me a little bit cold, a little bit colder on an emotional level than some of the other films. Still, I think if you're going to watch A24 horror films, this movie is a must-watch, as are all of the other movies above it. As far as how A24 it is, on the bleakness scale, this movie gets an 8 out of 8. This movie is about as bleak as you can be. As far as how abstract it is, it gets a 7 out of 8, and that very easily could have been an 8. And as far as the audience-critic divide, they weren't too far apart on that. Critics gave it a 90%, audiences gave it a 71%. That's a 19% gap for a total score of A19 out of A24. You're too slow. You a dullard? No, sir. Fooled me. At number 12 on this list is another A24 release from earlier this year that I almost didn't rewatch because I watched it in theaters back in the spring, but I'm actually glad that I did. It's a movie called I Saw the TV Glow, and going in knowing already what the movie had up its sleeve and that it was in many ways, as I found out afterwards, a metaphor for being trans, which comes directly from director Jane Schoenbrunn, I appreciated I Saw the TV Glow a lot more the second time around. Justice Smith plays a teenager named Owen who bonds with an older girl named Maddie, played by Bridget Lundy Payne, over a teen show called The Pink Opaque, which airs on this movie's version of Nickelodeon's Saturday Night lineup with a little bit of Buffy the Vampire Slayer thrown in. After Maddie disappears, Owen spends the years afterwards still obsessed with the show until Maddie suddenly reappears with information that ties the two of them closer to The Pink Opaque than ever before. I Saw the TV Glow is a movie that is dense with meaning, especially difficult to parse through if you don't really know the director's intentions going in. And I understand some people would say, well, you shouldn't have to know, but I think the movie is enhanced by knowing just exactly what this movie's inspirations were. I do think it's a little too dense, and I think it keeps us at arm's length a little too much. That's why it's this low on my list. But when you look at it through the director's lens, it's also an incredibly affecting movie. It's about the idea of a character living a life that he's convinced isn't right, but who's also afraid to make a risky leap for the chance at living another one. It's devastating when you realize that these fictional struggles mirror the actual struggles of so many people in real life. Of all the movies that I rewatched, I would say this one moved up in my estimation the most, but I also understand why it doesn't work for some people. I'm sure there are folks that reacted to it like I did with M Fabric or Men, where the messages seem pretty clear. It just was too out there, or too abstract, or too different 
for me to connect with. And that's why these things are so personal and subjective. I saw the TV Glow did click a lot more with me this time. And I think even when you put the film's meaning aside, it's still an incredibly imaginative movie, well shot and acted, and one that I think shows a lot of creative talent and ambition. As far as where it lands on the A24 scale, it gets an eight out of eight for bleakness. These characters do not live happy lives. It gets an eight out of eight for how abstract it is. And it gets a seven out of eight as far as audience critic divide. Audiences gave it a 49% while critics gave it an 84%. That's a 35% gap. That means that I saw the TV glow comes just one point away from a perfect score. It has an A23 out of A24. If critics had liked it a little more or audiences had liked it a little less, then it would have been a 24 out of 24, but still the new leader. What about you? Do you like girls? I, I think that I like TV shows. Next up at number 11 is the first film in the X franchise, not the first chronological film, but the first one released, and it's called X, no surprise there. Ty West kicks things off with a slasher movie set in 1979. A group of porn actors and the crew rent a house on an isolated farm to secretly film a porno, but the home's owners, including elderly woman Pearl, don't take well to these strangers, and as they start getting picked off one by one, it's revealed that the couple has way more issues issues than anyone could have imagined. X is blessed with a great cast, including Mia Goth, who I didn't even realize was playing two parts until the credits began to roll, and Jenna Ortega. This movie got her just as she was launched into the stratosphere. It's similar to The Monster in that it's not as rich or psychologically complex as a lot of these other movies, but it's a really good execution of a simple premise. Taken as just a slasher movie, it's got some well-executed kills, it uses the blood and gore factor to just the right side of the extreme, and it features performances that are a cut above of what you usually see in a movie like this. Yes, it's simple, but as I said, I don't necessarily think you should punish the movie for that. And what X delivers is sort of an elevated slasher film. At this level, the difference between movies isn't really that big, and X has a lot of ugh moments and a lot of style that gets it to just above the other movies. As far as how A24 the movie is, I'm going to give it a 4 out of 8 on the bleakness scale, a one out of eight on how abstract it is. It's actually pretty straightforward. And as far as the audience critic divide, critics gave it 94%, audiences gave it 70%. That's a 24 point gap, so it gets a five out of eight for a total A24 score of A10 out of A24. Ford ain't only gonna be for perverts no more. Oh, toast to the perverts. They've been paying our bills for years. Kicking off the top 10 is a movie that I think is just as much a comedy as it is a horror film, and that is Bodies, Bodies, Bodies. I love a good horror comedy, and this movie's great at being both. A group of young people gets together at a mansion to throw a hurricane party, but when one of them ends up dead, they all begin to suspect each other, and the paranoia gets stronger every time a new body is added to the pile. Alice, how long have you known Greg? Like... Long. This was the English language feature debut of Helena Rain, who has a movie called Baby Girl that is set up to be a big awards contender as we get to the end of the year. And what I like a lot about Bodies, Bodies, Bodies is that it is a movie that is about the younger generation, the kids, if you will, that's able to poke fun at them without feeling bitter or scornful. Yes, these characters bicker about things like podcasts and group texts and microaggressions, but it doesn't come off as a group of filmmakers shaking their fists at the youngins. These are characters that are well-written and established as deeply flawed people who use superficial reasons and actual problems to try to solve their petty ones. Amanda Stenberg, Maria Bakalova, Lee Pace, Rachel Sennett, Pete Davidson, Mihala Howard, and Chase Swee Wonders breathe life into all of their characters and form a great ensemble. Each one of these characters has a past or some sort of connection with at least one of the other characters. And instead of making them stereotypes, which might make it seem like this is a movie about mocking Gen Z or whatever else you want to say, these feel like actual flawed and damaged people who are working that damage out under the most extreme circumstances. You hate listen to her podcast. Wait, what? 
Bodies, Bodies, Bodies is a movie that I'm going to return to a lot, probably especially around Halloween because it scratches that horror movie itch. It's got a lot of laughs and I like the characters. Again, it's not some sort of indictment of the youth. I think it's really just proof that screwed up characters can be born into any generation. When we look at the movie's A24 score, as far as bleakness, it gets a three out of eight. It gets a one out of eight on the abstract scale. It's very straightforward. And as far as the audience critic divide, critics gave it 86%, audiences gave it 62%. That's a 24% difference, which gives it a score of five out of eight and a total A24 score of A9 out of A24. Your parents are upper middle class. No, they're not. They teach at a university. It's public. Up next at number nine is the second film from Ari Aster to grace this list, but not the last. It's a movie called Midsommar and it has more than a touch of Wicker Man to it, but doesn't come off as a ripoff or derivative. Florence Pugh plays Danny, an emotionally struggling young woman who goes with her boyfriend and a group of his friends to a midsummer festival in Sweden. I should note that it is a midsummer festival, but as nearly as I could tell on the internet, the movie's actually supposed to be called Midsommar, although I've heard it every different way. I, I don't know, I'm doing my best here. This movie has a lot thematically in common with Ari Aster's other movies, things like family trauma, dealing with mental illness, the degradation of relationships, the idea that maybe the world is out to get you. But what I love about Midsommar specifically is that it uses the horror unfolding on screen to frame the degradation of personal relationships, particularly between Danny and her boyfriend Christian, who's played by Jack Rayner. Florence Pugh had a breakout year in 2019, and this movie was a big reason why she is going through something in this movie that is intensely personal, and yet none of the people close to her seem to view her as anything but a burden. She only begins to find family with this group of strangers in Sweden, and I think it's this imbalance in her personal relationships that helps to temper the idea for the audience that she would stick around despite the escalating insanity that's happening around her. This is not the most traumatic event of this character's life. This is just another thing to add to the list. But the movie's not all trauma and death, etc. I mean, that's a lot of it. It also has some funny moments throughout, including Will Poulter, who puts in a good performance as a classically dumb American. It's a dead tree, though. It's dead. Yeah, yeah, I know, but it's important to us. I just had to pee. I didn't know it was special. Ari Aster has publicly said that this is a breakup movie inside the framework of a horror folk tale. And I think that the movie works even better when you kind of put aside the horror elements and just track Danny's journey throughout the film. Having said that, the horror stuff is pretty extreme and the movie never really tips its hand too much about what we're about to see. We experience it along with the characters until things have gotten so crazy that there's really no going back. The performances and the character work and the characters in the film mean that Midsommar is a movie that I'm going to revisit, although probably not every year because this is not the easiest watch in the world. I mean, it is cathartic in many ways, but even catharsis has its limits. I would like to thank the film though, personally, for teaching me the lesson that if I'm ever served lemonade at a midsummer festival, that I need to examine that lemonade very closely. On the A24 scale, Midsommar gets a seven out of eight as far as how bleak it is. This is a bleak movie. A two out of eight as far as how abstract it is. And when it comes to audiences and critics, critics gave it an 83%, audiences gave it a 64%. That's a 19% difference for a score of four out of eight, which means that Midsommar scores an A13 out of A24. What's going on? At number eight on the list is another first time watch for me, and it's from director Jonathan Glazer, who had a big award season hit last year with The Zone of Interest. The movie's called Under the Skin, which was the first horror film released by A24 and their seventh movie released overall. And it helps set the tone for what kind of movie A24 would be known for. As we've talked about, this is not just an A24 horror movie. This is also an a24 horror movie. Under the Skin stars Scarlett Johansson as something whose task it is to study and seduce men, then lure them to their deaths so that their organs can be extracted for some other reason. Under the Skin's not really concerned with answering questions, but it's also 
not really a frustrating film because Jonathan Glazer knows how to get the information across that he needs to through simple editing and shooting. For example, Johansson's character seems to work in some kind of a cycle. If she ever diverges from her mission, she's replaced with another version of herself. And that's never explicitly said, but we notice that in the early parts of the movie, she only notices potential targets who are young men and has complete apathy for humanity in general. But as the movie goes on, we see that she starts noticing women, babies, older men. She starts to develop a sense of sympathy and guilt. She experiences kindness and wants to know more about what it means to be human. And this emerging humanity puts her in danger. All of this information is told to us through visual storytelling and mostly nonverbal acting from Scarlett Johansson. And it's a great reminder that a competent director can tell a story using only the visual language of cinema and being able to direct actors well. It's basic stuff but this movie really makes it work. Under the Skin isn't everyone's vibe, but it was very much mine, and it also validates what my own suspicions would be if someone who looked like Scarlett Johansson tried to pick me up while I was walking down the street, because I know that if I found myself sinking down into that black goo, it would be very hard for me not to just say, I knew it. As far as how A24 this movie is, I'm giving it a bleakness score of seven out of eight on multiple fronts, an abstract score of six out of eight. And as far as the audience critic divide, critics gave it an 84%, audiences gave it a 55%. That's a 29 point difference for a six out of eight and a total A24 score of A19 out of A24. At number seven on my list is another movie that was a second time watch for me, and it was another movie that I also appreciated more the second time I watched it, and that is The Witch, another movie from Robert Eggers, and I think a big reason why I liked the movie more this time was that I watched it without the hype that accompanied it. The Witch was sold maybe more than any other A24 film of its era as a mainstream jump scare movie, the most terrifying film that you've ever seen. They were running ads on MTV every five or 10 minutes, and this was back in the days when MTV used to show stuff besides a 24-7 block of ridiculousness. The Witch is about a family who's exiled from a New England town in the 1630s and tries to survive off the land on their own. When her baby brother disappears, appears right from under her nose and her siblings begin to fall ill. Thomason, the eldest child played by Andy Taylor-Joy, tries to defend herself from accusations of witchcraft from her parents played by Ralph Ineson and Kate Dickey. I am no witch, father. What did I but see in my house? Well, you not hear me. Isolation can be so effective in horror films and you can't really get much more isolated than living alone with your family in the forest, cut off from all communication, exiled from society. The Witch is a slow burn, but an effective one. I can see why audiences who are expecting a more traditional horror movie were disappointed, but that's on the movie's marketing team, not the movie itself. And it did set some benchmarks for A24, including once again, that you should never get too attached to the family dog, and also that you should expect dinner time to be a very uncomfortable time of day. How thou could lose me, Father Silver Winecup, in this hovel, I cannot know. I haven't face child. The Witch was the first film and also the breakout role for Anya Taylor-Joy, and she gives a great performance. It's a variation on a theme that Hitchcock would use all the time, the person who's wrongfully accused or the person who's labeled insane when they're actually sane but can't convince anybody that they're sane. It's primal stuff that we're dealing with here. What happens when those closest in your life lose trust in you? It's a very scary question. Add in some genuinely terrifying supernatural elements, and The Witch becomes a film that helped define an era for A24. If you were caught up in the hype initially for this movie and walked away disappointed, I'd say give it another shot because I think removed from the moment, this may be a movie that you enjoy more than you remembered. As far as how A24 it is, on the bleakness scale, it gets an 8 out of 8. It is bleak in just about every way you can imagine. On the abstract scale, I'm giving it a 6 out of 8. There's a lot of questioning of reality here. And as far as the audience critic divide, critics gave it a 91%. Audiences gave it a 60. I think they've come around over the years for a 31% gap. That's still a 7 out of 8 on that division score, which means that The Witch scores an A21 out of A24. Black Phillips, if you are wicked, I told me too. 
Damn your black Philip. Next up is a movie that I would not have categorized as a horror film, but three of my four sources did. Although I will say, I think it's more of a horror movie than Dream Scenario or Bo is Afraid. And that movie is The Killing of a Sacred Deer, which was Yorgos Lanthimos' follow-up to The Lobster, a movie that I loved, and that carried over the dreamlike detachment of that film, helped by the fact that Lobster star Colin Farrell returned to star in this one as well. Farrell plays an open heart surgeon named Stephen Murphy, who's formed a bond with Martin, the son of a patient who died on his operating table, played by Barry Keoghan. However, Stephen and Martin's relationship begins to deteriorate when Stephen's kids develop a mysterious paralyzing illness and Martin informs him that he must choose a family member to die to atone for killing his father. I can't tell you who to kill, of course, that's for you to decide, but if you don't do it, they will all get sick and die. Bob will die, Kim will die, your wife will die. It's never really explained how Martin is able to make these things happen, but it doesn't really matter. This is not a movie about the how or the why of what we're seeing. It's a darkly comic or comically dark movie about the disintegration of this family slowly as Stephen first struggles to believe and then struggles to solve the problem that's been put in front of him. If I had to pick a genre for this movie, I'd say comedy. There are the usual non sequiturs that Yorgos Lanthimos does so well. He has lovely hair. What about mine? You have lovely hair too. We all have lovely hair. And there's also some dark comedy mined from things like Stephen trying to make his son admit that he's lying about his own paralysis. I will take my electric razor and I will shave your head and make you eat your hair. I will literally make you eat your hair. I'm not kidding. Or attempting to solve the matter of which family member to kill by quizzing an unwitting school principal. Do you especially like one of them more than the other? If you had to choose between them, which would you say is the best? But it can't be denied that The Killing of a Sacred Deer does have some horror elements, and Yorgos Lanthimos is great about sort of disguising those elements under that veil of absurdity until he decides it's the time to pull the rug out from under you. It is objectively terrifying to have to choose a family member to kill in order to save them all from dying, but it's all done in such a nonchalant way that you can't help but laugh. Throw in the most memorable spaghetti scene since Lady and the Tramp, and The Killing of a Sacred Deer is a movie that you may not think is horror, but you definitely won't soon forget. On the A24 scale, it gets a 6 out of 8 as far as how bleak it is, a 5 out of 8, on the abstract scale, it's a little more straightforward than you might think. And as far as the audience critic divide, critics gave it a 78%, audiences gave it a 63. That's a 15% difference for a three out of eight and an overall score of A14 out of A24. I don't know if what is happening is fair, but it's the, uh, the only thing I can think of as close to justice. We're now entering the top five, and my number five movie is another one that was a first-time watch for me, and I think it's a movie that would probably be known by more people or have a higher profile if its theatrical distribution had not been disrupted by the pandemic. The movie's called Saint Maud, and it's from director Rose Glass, whose second film, Love Lies Bleeding, came out earlier this year, and I actually really enjoyed. Morveth Clark plays Maud, a home health nurse who also has an intense focus on religion. When she's assigned to palliative care for a dying dancer, played by Jennifer Ely, Maud becomes obsessed with saving the dancer's soul as her religious visions grow more and more prominent. Eventually, Maud's spiral becomes troubling, and we start to question what we really know about her and if her visions are real or something more dangerous. It took me a little while to get into the groove of St. Maud, but once I did, the movie really dug its claws into me. Morveth Clark is great in this role, and the script is good at introducing us to Maud and certain things about her, and then making us question if we should really believe what we've already been told. This is definitely a movie of escalation, and as we get towards the end, it has one of the best executed jump scares that I can remember in a long time, as well as a truly haunting ending. I've actually thought about this ending several times, and I think that's really what ties it all together. I always say that I don't mind a slow burn if the payoff is worth it, and St. Maud is evidence of that. It was a pleasant surprise that shook up the top five, which I thought was pretty set. If St. Maud is on your list and you just haven't seen it yet, do so. Don't be fooled by its lower profile. This is one of A24's 
best horror movies. When it comes to how A24 it is, it gets an 8 out of 8 on the bleakness scale, a 6 out of 8 when it comes to how abstract the film is. We're dealing with a lot of visions and things we don't quite know about whether they're happening or not, but not in an alienating way. And as far as the audience critic divide, critics gave the film a 92%, audiences gave it a 67. That's a 25 point difference for a score of 5 out of 8 and an overall A24 score of A19 out of A24. I am transformed and soon everyone will see. At number four on my list is the third film in the X trilogy on my list. The second film that was released, but the first as far as the timeline goes, and it is Pearl. Pearl's biggest asset can be summed up in two words, Mia Goth. The prequel to X takes place in the late 1910s as Pearl waits for her husband to return from World War I under the watchful eye of her demanding mother and a father who's been incapacitated due to illness. Mia Goth was great in X, but she takes it to another level in Pearl. And I genuinely believed in 2022 that this movie should have been given major awards consideration. Mia Goth is just that good. All I really want is to be loved. I'm having such a hard time without it lately. Prequels can be tough because we know generally where the end point is. So the movie lives or dies by the journey and how we get there. And Ty West did something really smart by changing things up stylistically, swapping X's grindhouse feel for the lush technicolor of old Hollywood and introducing Pearl as a sympathetic character. Pearl is lonely, she's isolated, and she dreams of the one thing that she doesn't get at home, which is adoration, the spotlight. She wants everyone in the world to see just how special she is, and these desperate desires awaken or likely are heightened by a natural darkness inside of her. And seeing her slowly spiral gives the movie a sense of inevitability and dread. Pearl definitely feels like an A24 horror film complete with uncomfortable family dinner scene. Then what a fine woman you hope to become leaving your mother alone to rot so you could dance with a bunch of silly whores. But it's less a slasher film than a psychological drama, topped off by a five plus minute monologue that signals Pearl's final descent into madness, but also kind of breaks your heart at the same time. I like a well done character piece and Mia Goth and Ty West really deliver here. I think it transcends the horror genre as many of these do, and it's just a flat out great movie. It uses what we know from X to take Pearl from horror movie villain to a tragic yet terrifying main character. And it accomplishes so much of what Maxine didn't do when it comes to character and world building, all while Mia Goth gives one of the all time great lead performances in a horror movie. When we look at the movie on the A24 scale, it gets a bleakness score of four out of eight, an abstract score of one out of eight, and when it comes to audiences and critics, critics gave it a 93%, audiences gave it an 80%, so that's pretty close. That's just a 13% difference for a score of 3 out of 8 and an overall A24 score of A8 out of A24. Felt good. Killing's easier than you think. We are in the top three now, and my number three movie was also in my top 10 list for 2016, it was directed by Jeremy Saunier, who went on to make Rebel Ridge, which is a huge hit for Netflix just a few weeks ago. And that movie is called Green Room, which has a great cast, including the sadly late actor Anton Yelchin, who passed away weeks after A24 released this film. Most of Green Room takes place at a neo-Nazi bar where a punk band, including Yelchin, Ali Shawkat, Joe Cole, and Callum Turner take a desperation gig after their planned show is canceled. Unfortunately for them, they witness the aftermath of a murder and find themselves locked in the bar's green room, trying to avoid being killed themselves by the skinheads who own the bar, led by Darcy in a great villainous turn by Patrick Stewart. You can't keep us here, man. You gotta let us go. We're not keeping you. You're just staying. One location horror is great because it's easy to get a sense of the geography. Within 10 minutes of things kicking off, we know where the good guys are, where the bad guys are, what each one of them is planning. We get to hear their strategy sessions. We know the traps that are being laid. And that just ups the stakes because we understand more so than a lot of the characters even, what's about to happen. We fear for them ahead of time. And that fear is warranted because the deaths in Green Room are sudden and brutal. Once the skinheads drop any pretense that they plan to let anyone from the band survive, this movie becomes all out survival warfare. Just shoot who is left. 
They don't have to be accounted for. Forensics is no longer a concern. When your bad guys are Nazis, it's easy to make them one-dimensional because they're, I mean, they're Nazis. But what I like about this movie is they don't just cast the Nazis as generic bad guys. They're somewhat cunning because they're on their home turf. The band is at a disadvantage, and so much of the movie is about trying to claw that advantage back. This is a cat and mouse game, and there are no half victories. It is kill or be killed, and they are working against some pretty tough conditions. Green Room is unpredictable, suspenseful, and for the last half completely merciless you genuinely don't believe that anyone is safe and at times the situation appears to be completely hopeless that last shred of hope that solution that ray of light is what the band is looking for and it's what we as an audience are rooting for and i think that this is one of the best thrillers that's been made in the last 10 years it's also a sad reminder of just how much talent we lost with the passing of Anton Yelchin, who's great in the lead role. If you haven't seen Green Room, I recommend firing it up and strapping yourself in because once you start watching this movie, you will not be able to stop. As far as its level of A24-ness, on the bleak scale, it gets a seven out of eight. I mean, we are talking about attempted murder at a Nazi bar. On the abstract scale, I'm actually giving it a zero out of eight. It plays pretty above board. And on the audience critic division, critics gave it a 90%. Audiences gave it 75%. That gives it a 15% gap and a three out of eight, which is a total A24 score of A10 out of A24. It's a nightmare. At number two is something that I generally only get a few times a year. It is a movie that completely surprises me because I thought this was just going to be a run-of-the-mill supernatural horror film and it became one of my favorite horror movies of the 2020s. The movie is called Talk to Me and it's the feature debut of brothers Danny and Michael Philippou, Australian filmmakers who got their start right here on YouTube. Their next film is also being made with A24 and will likely get released next year. Talk to Me stars Sophie Wilde as Mia, who's mourning the death of her mother under mysterious circumstances. When a popular party game that involves channeling the spirit world blows up on social media, Mia sees it as a way to potentially connect with her mom's ghost and find out crucial information about her death. But things go horribly wrong when a malevolent spirit crosses the plane instead and throws Mia's life, as well as the lives of her best friend's family, into total chaos. Of course, there are iconic horror movies, but there are also iconic horror props. And the hand from Talk To Me is one of my favorite horror movie props of all time. Obviously, I've got it here on the set. It's just so effective and simple. And that's really what the movie is. The scares in this movie are effective and simple. The idea of possession really freaks me out, just personally. And how the movie portrays it is so straightforward, but also so scary. As I often say about horror movies, there are only so many ways to do a scare or to do a ghost story, etc. What it really becomes about when we're talking about the quality of the film is what I feel about the characters. And Talk To Me gives me several characters that I care about and that I want to see survive, even though some of them are flawed. Mia being first and foremost among them. Most of these people are just normal kids whose biggest sin is wanting to fit in and participate in a viral trend. Mia's got a little bit of extra motivation in wanting to contact her mother, but that desperation leads her to make some critical mistakes that have huge consequences. Talk To Me really embodies A24's approach to horror, which is that you don't need big stars and you don't need a big budget in order to make a great horror film. It kind of takes the genre back to its roots. And Talk To Me is a movie that costs less than $5 million, but had great talent behind it, in front of and behind the camera, and that's really what matters. I love when a movie exceeds my expectations, and that was definitely the case with Talk To Me, and it gets extra credit for having Miranda Otto as one of the best movie moms ever. You are not drinking tonight. On God, I will punch you in the face. As far as how A24 the movie is it, it gets a seven out of eight when it comes to how bleak it is. This movie gets pretty desperate. It gets a four out of eight on the abstract scale. The reality questioning thing isn't a huge part of the film. And when it comes to audiences and critics, they were pretty close together. Critics give the movie a 94%. Audiences gave it a 79% for a 15% gap and an overall score of A14 out of A24. 
And now we arrive at number one. And if you've ever seen the channel, if you've ever heard me talk about movies or horror movies or Oscars or anything like that in the last six years or so, then this movie should not be a surprise because for me, there was ever only going to be one movie at number one, and that is Hereditary which came out in 2018. It's not just my favorite A24 horror movie. It is one of my favorite movies ever. Letterboxd tells me that I've watched Hereditary six times since it came out. I think it might be more. The most recent time was when they put it back in theaters in IMAX earlier this year. And quite frankly, I could go watch it right now. That's the great thing about great movies, the ones you really love. You can watch them anytime you want. It's hard to say anything about this movie without feeling like I'm just repeating myself. Tony Collette plays Annie, an artist who's just lost her mother and is only beginning to deal with that when another family tragedy strikes. The rest of the film is a slow descent into hell as Annie grows increasingly unstable and some sort of sinister presence begins to intrude more and more into the family's life. It should be noted that Hereditary contains the definitive uncomfortable family dinner scene in any A24 horror film. And that scene is also absolute proof, I'm going to say it again and I'm going to say it till the day that I die, that Tony Collette was robbed of an Oscar nomination for Hereditary, hashtag an Oscar for Tony forever. I am your mother! All I do is worry and slave and defend you. And all I get back is that face on your face. I'm just such a fan of this movie. I find something new every time that I watch it that I didn't notice before. And I love it just as much every time I watched it as I did the first time. It ignited a passion and a curiosity about it that few other movies have. And I found that when you find movies like that, the ones that you don't just like, but that you love, that make you excited about the art form, and it's not just movies, it's a song, it's a painting, it's whatever. When art connects to you in that way, then you should just treasure that art. So I treasure Hereditary, I treasure Tony Collette in the movie, and I gotta give a shout out as well to Alex Wolf, Gabriel Byrne, Millie Shapiro, and Ann Dowd for their amazing performances in this movie. It's not just about Tony Collette. Ari Aster could do nothing for the rest of his career but release progressively longer and more meandering cuts of Bo is Afraid, and I would still be appreciative of him for making this movie. And you know, is Hereditary most people's number one movie? As far as A24 horror goes, I'm sure it's not, but it is my number one, and hey, this is my list. That's what ranking is all about. It's about saying what movie you love the most. For me, it's hereditary, and quite frankly, it wasn't even close. When we look at just how A24 hereditary is, it gets an 8 out of 8 for bleakness, a 4 out of 8 when it comes to how abstract the film is, and when it comes to the audience critic divide, critics gave it 90%. Audiences actually came around. It's at a 71% right now. That's just a 19% difference for a score of four out of eight on the audience critic scale and an A16 out of A24 overall. I can't accept and I can't forgive because nobody admits anything they've done. And that's it. That's my list. All 29 eligible A24 horror films from number 29 all the way down to number one. So we know what the movies are as far as personal preference, but let's take a look back and recap which movie scored the highest as far as being the most A24 movies. When it comes to the top contenders, Climax scored an A17 out of A24. Two movies, In Fabric and It Comes at Night, scored an A18 out of A24. Three films, St. Maud, The Lighthouse, and Under the Skin, scored an A19 out of A24. Men scored an A20 out of A24. The Witch scored an A21 out of A24. Lamb scored an A22 out of A24. And by my scale and my measurements, the most A24 film is I Saw the TV Glow, which scored an almost perfect A23 out of A24. So those are my personal preferences. What are yours? What A24 films are your favorites? Which ones did you just not connect to so much? Let me know down in the comments below. And thanks so much for watching this video. I hope you have a wonderful and safe Halloween and come back right here to the channel. I'll be doing more movie news reviews, box office, and everything else that we do here. Until next time, stay safe. I am your mother. And I'll see you next time.